They were most of you are supposed to be sober and awake for these presentations in the morning. And tomorrow will be the day that you come in groggy and barely making it on time, kind of like me. Um, so but hopefully you have a nice uh, Byward Market experience at some point during your trip, uh, if you haven't. Uh, I recommend Stephen Frost as, a, as an ample guide for those kind of adventures. Uh, hopefully what, uh, what I talk about today will not be as detrimental to your health as certain market experiences could be. I guess most of you are probably coming from the keynote. Yes. It was awesome. Okay. Yeah. It was, a, it was a large ramp up process this morning. Uh, right. All right. So I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, I, I don't know when we're supposed to start, but I think it was like 10. So hopefully, hopefully we'll be okay. Uh, so this is this is charting for massive growth. Um, I am your humble host, Robert Tree. Uh, I work for a company called Omni We're known for doing sort of large scale, large scale scalability work. It's kind of redundant. Um, we work with a lot of Postgres, which is kind of why I'm here uh, and why I deal with Postgres stuff. Uh, we also use Oracle and MySQL for other things when we can't get away from it. Um, we even will use other stuff as well if we're forced into it. Uh, I would say generally we prefer Postgres and, and most of this stuff uh, that I'll be talking about is definitely applicable to Postgres. So I'm going to imagine most of you are, are building Postgres based infrastructure and that's why you're here. Um, so this should all apply but uh, since this is also somewhat just about patterns, uh, it could be applied to other software. Relational databases from that standpoint are, are all very similar from a very high level point of view. So uh, if you're using other stuff or you have a mixed architecture, this could still apply. Yeah. So what is sharding for the purposes of this talk? Um, we are very fortunate in the database world that most of the terminology that we use doesn't actually mean the same thing depending on the context you're in. Uh, if people ask you for straight answers, then saying it depends is actually, you know, something that seems to be fairly acceptable. So, for the purposes of this talk, um, I'm, I'm going to look at charting uh, as, as sort of in the in the line of scalability patterns. So I don't know if you've seen. I've, I've done other talks on scalability patterns, um, and I have one where I sort of walk you through the steps that, that most applications go through, right? Where you start out with a simple database. Uh, you might do vertical partitioning, which is sort of the built-in partitioning that you get with Postgres. Uh, then you'll do vertical scaling, where you're buying bigger and bigger boxes and moving that architecture around. Uh, then usually that breaks out into read slaves, where you've gone and, and now you have, you know, Sloan, Elon East, whatever it might be. You're, you're pushing that data out and doing read slaves. Um, but for what we're talking about here is really just the last step, which is this horizontal partitioning, right, where you actually now have uh, generally, it's forced by write load, so you now have a large enough write load that even vertical scaling, you're getting to the limits of where you can do that. Um, it, it's probably not something, I, I think people jump into this too often in a lot of cases. You can definitely scale Postgres very, very high, uh, even on a single node, especially if you do read slaves. Right? You can do, I mean, easily millions of users and you know thousands of transactions and all that stuff is, is not hard to obtain. Um, so. Before you would jump directly to this step, I just want to say I would hope you'll go through the other steps first. Uh, try those routes, do the vertical scaling, um, your life will be easier. But since we're here and I'm going to talk about the horizontal partitioning stuff, uh, let, let's dive into that. So, so given my, my thought that you should stick with vertical scaling if you can before you jump into this, the question then becomes why would you use sharding? Uh, and there's basically three reasons that most people come up with uh, for why they go into this sharding type of architecture. Right? So the first is basically scaling large data sets without large hardware. Right? You also want to try to eliminate single points of failure in your architecture and then achieve maximum of time. So when I talk about scaling large data sets without large hardware, uh, we're talking either millions of users 
right? So that you have a fairly decent sized amount of data um, or millions of operations, right? Even if you don't have a, a, you know terabytes worth of data, if you have millions of users, you still might be doing you know tens to hundreds of thousands of transactions a day. So being able to handle that, uh, typically on what is considered commodity hardware. So I don't know exactly what most people consider commodity hardware, but I think fairly common stuff that you can buy that's not too expensive, probably in the realm of like 64 gigs of RAM. I wouldn't go over that at least. Right. So 32 might be more appropriate, but uh, if you're talking 128 gigs of RAM or you know half a terabyte of RAM, whatever that is, that sort of gets you into the we're going to spend a lot of money on hardware realm, and that does work fine. But a lot of people don't want to go that route. Right? They don't want to get into that. Um, also, when it comes to disk architectures, you know you can buy NetApp or you can you know get 28 spindles or whatever. I think on most commodity hardware, I'm going to put that around six disks. Uh, if you're just buying regular pizza boxes, I wouldn't expect that you would have much more than that, right? You're, you're not going to have like 20 spindles on your machine. Uh, if you're doing that, you're, you're going into the we're going to scale this through hardware, right? And nothing wrong with that. I love it. It's great. Um, just not what we're trying to focus on here, right? There are people that say we don't really want to get into, you know, we've dealt with HP or Dell or, you know, whoever. And those relationships always suck. So you're spending like hundreds of thousands of dollars on hardware, and you don't like these people. So instead of doing that, we want to stick with generic commodity style hardware, right? So that's the type of, of underlying hardware that you expect people to find, and they still want to be able to handle the thousands of users or thousands of transactions, millions of users. <coughs> so the other thing, the the single points of failure. Uh, if you think of it from this standpoint, right, the, the basic idea is that if you have a single database, you have a single point of failure, right? Uh, if you have bad disks, if you have RAM that goes bad, uh, you have a CPU that comes out on you, um, all of those essentially lead to 100% of an outage for your system, right? Even if you have failover, right? Because at some point, you know, something's going to go wrong, you'll have at least a reduced amount of response from your system. Right, depending on what particularly goes wrong and, and what time of day. Um, but if you're going to fail over to another machine, you've, you've probably experienced an outage on that service at some point. And if you only have one database, and that's where everybody's going to, and that's where all services of your system have to go through, then you've got an outage for every person in your, in your system. Right? So a lot of people would like to eliminate that thing. And even with failover, you can mitigate it, but you really can't eliminate it. Right? So the idea of sharding, we're going to have multiple boxes. We'll have you know, no single point of failure. So that if one box goes down, we can at least keep some of the system up. Right? So that's sort of the thinking behind that. It really dovetails also into the idea of achieving maximum uptime. Uh, and I'll say again, even if you have failover, uh, there's a lot of things that will cause you to want to restart your database. Right? Uh, and, and probably the best one is actually if you're just going to try to upgrade Postgres, which is what we all recommend, right, every time there's a dot release, you must upgrade your Postgres, right? That's, that's pretty well, well said mantra at this point. Um, but to do that, you have to restart your database. So again, if all of your services flow into that, uh, into that single database, then you have no way to really do that that doesn't cause some type of disruption to your system. Right. So, those are the things that we're, we're trying to, to work around those kinds of problems. And, and there are other ways to sort of go about attacking that. Um, if you have like a replication solution, you know, like Sloney, you can switch your master. So you can try that. You then still have to synchronize you know, your web application so nobody's writing to the wrong node you know, while you're in the process of switching over. Um, if you're using the built-in replication with Postgres, you, you don't really have a switch over option. Right? So, so it, it's not as easy to just get rid of from the standpoint of, well, I'll just throw up a replication slave and then that'll work, right? It does depend on the nature of your, you know, biz, you know, your business, your application, the services you provide, whether or not you really need to go for this sort of maximum uptime approach. Uh, I have, you know, one client who's in, like, the top 1,000, at least, uh, websites, but their traffic is very spiky, right? Like, once a day they get traffic that would you know, out, outpace Amazon, but then the rest of the day, their traffic's really low. So if we need maintenance windows for them, we need to do upgrades, it's not a problem. We just do it, you know, 12 hours off of where their traffic spike is every day, and then they're fine. So they don't need to really go into this type of thing. Uh, 
Um, but for other people, you are running 24-7 operations. Uh, if you're doing you know, global operations, you're in multiple countries, there may not be a good downtime window that you can find for maintenance that, that you might need to do. All right. So in those cases, that's where you're saying, we need to be up, if, if our system goes down, even if we control it, we can measure the dollars lost you know, in the amount of time it takes to restart the system. Uh, and especially as you get into like, if you're doing you know, transaction processes like credit cards and that kind of thing, there's a lot of stuff that you know you have to do kernel upgrades and, and things like that. There's like PCI compliance issues. The more industry regulation you get into, uh, you know there are rules and suits that are forcing you to do things you don't want to do, like restart your servers. Um, you know, but that's sort of the nature of the beast. <coughs> so if you have those problems again, and going down for any reason at all means. I'm going to lose money, you're going to start pushing towards this. How do we get maximum off time uh, without having any problems? Right. So that's sort of the third reason of, of why people will start to say, well, let's go into sharding, let's do the multiple architecture, the multiple boxes architecture, uh, and see how well we can build on that. So for horizontal partitioning, there's basically two approaches that most people go down for this. Uh, one is to do what is typically referred to as sharding, right, where you're going to split your data based on a working logical model. Right? The other one is, is what I kind of call the SOA approach, uh, where you're more splitting your data based on functional pieces of your architecture. Right? Uh, SOA meaning services oriented architecture was a big buzzword I think in like the mid 90s, maybe the early 2000s, kind of went away and now people are actually starting to do it more often. Um, I'll start with talking about SOA because I think it's a lot easier to wrap your head around uh, and, and then we'll go into to sharding a bit more. So when you do the SOA style partitioning, right, it, it's a fairly simple concept of if you think of your database and you've built up a, a system over a number of years, you now offer a bunch of different services, you sort of look at that schema and you divide it up by job operation. Right? You move each piece of functionality onto its own server. right? And then in cases where you have a need for duplicate data, you will go ahead and replicate that or, or find a way for your application to ship that around. Right? So a good example would be, let's just say you know, you're running your website, uh, you have users, you have items that they're doing stuff with, and maybe like a forum right, for, for people to talk to each other. Uh, and you could do that all in one system, and a lot of places start out that way. You know, but at some point, the demands of read and write from those different pieces of the system actually have sort of different look to them, right? Forums probably going to be heavier write uh, as people are talking, and to use that service, you need to do a lot of write operations. If you're talking about like an items catalog, you know, there'll be some writes as people are putting items into the system, but most of that traffic is probably read. So if you look at that, look at it that way, it's usually easy to start splitting off certain pieces uh, into their own systems and then running them that way. You'll need user data on all of these, though, right? So that's the type of thing where you'd say, we would have to duplicate some data right, off to the different servers. But usually the price of that isn't, isn't too high. I mean, you look at how your, your system is laid out, there's usually only a couple of tables that really need to be duplicated across systems. Uh, and even those requirements may not necessarily be real time. Um, looking at this architecture, you could say, well, when a user signs up for my service, you know, I'll put him into the user's database, that component will handle that piece. He doesn't actually really need instant forums access, right? If I replicate that over to the forums database and it doesn't get there for, you know, five seconds or 10 minutes or 30 minutes, that's actually probably okay. You know, at the point at which his user ID shows up in the forums database, now he can go talk in the forums. Uh, but that, that might not be an instantaneous need. And this will be different for every, you know, business as you're sort of mapping this out. Uh, and, and so I'm just sort of trying to give a generic idea here of how you do this. Um, but you find those different components and then move them off. One thing that's very important is as you start to do this, uh, if you're going to try to achieve this idea of you know, lessening single points of failure and, and getting the uptime and that kind of thing, you have to separate those dependencies out of your application code first. Right? Uh, I've definitely seen the case where people have tried to do this where uh, if you think of like a home page, so the user will log into the system and then you want to show the number of unread posts of, that they have in the forum, right? So they log in, now if the forums database is down, it'll go to do a query on the forums, that database is down, it throws a big error on your home page, 
And you've actually given yourself multiple points of failure instead of trying to eliminate them. Right? Uh, what you really need to do in those types of situations as well, I'll have a home page, the user's going to log in, so we know they hit the user database. Uh, and if the user database is down, they can't log in. So that's, that's you know, sort of that component, and, and we'll keep it at that. We'd still like to show the count of the forums, but we'll go do the count. If the forums database is down, you know, we'll just display a message, like, don't talk to anyone right now. You know, forums are under maintenance. Uh, you know, whatever it is. So you put something up in its place so that your site is going on, but now anything goes wrong with that forums database, you're not taking out the whole service, right? You might have to say, hey, forums are currently offline. You know, that may or may not be a bad thing, but at least people can still log in. They can still look at items. There's other pieces of your service that they can still access and use, right? So you don't have to take the entire thing down just to do an upgrade or just to you know, put patches in or whatever it might be. Um, this also really enables you to do, uh, I would say, probably a, a more rapid pace of development as well, right? Because now you can do, if I need to do schema changes or something on, on any individual piece of the system, I now start to have the ability to say, well, I can just turn off certain pieces at a time uh, and push these changes out and more or less people still have the ability to interact with the site. It's important to realize that when you split this up, each node now becomes sort of an instance of the vertical scaling. Right? Uh, and you may decide, you know, if your forums package originally was built off of some third-party forum software, uh, and so then you split that out into its own system, you're replicating the user's data, but maybe you don't have a vested interest in really developing forum software. Right, so you just say, well, in this case, I'm just going to buy my way out of any problems that come up with forums. Right, the more traffic I get, I'll buy new hardware, uh, and you're basically back in that cycle again. Right, you can you can sort of upgrade these pieces as needed. They don't have to stay the same. Right, you can run different hardware. You can have different failure requirements. Uh, maybe for users' data, that's the most important thing. So. You know, you upgrade that to, to 9.1 and beta 4 or whatever, and now you're getting synchronous replication there, and you're going to convince everyone that that's very safe. Um, but for the forum stuff, you don't ever bother upgrading it because you just don't really care, right? It, it runs, and that's fine. Uh, and we don't spend a lot of time developing that piece. Right. So from, from that standpoint, you get, I would say, something that, that's pretty flexible, uh, pretty easy to break out. And again, you can scale this very, very large. Uh, you know, millions of users, depending on the hardware you want to pick and the things that you need to do. There's also nothing that prevents you from, from continuously sort of breaking this down further. Right? And we took that architecture and we said, well, you know what? what? One thing we need to do is we need to log into every piece. And right now we're replicating data to items and forums and users, but maybe we should just have a straight login service. Right? So we'll handle usernames and passwords there. Uh, anytime you want to use any part of our system, you go into the login service and that will make you, you know, that will sort of check into the site or whatever and, and you'll be good. Um, so if you break that piece out, now this has its own set of requirements, right? It has its own requirements for uh, uptime, reliability guarantees, uh, hardware needs that it'll have. It'll have its own, you know, read and write load characteristics. So. As you start to break these things out more, one thing you'll notice is, you know, the more fine-grained your services become, you actually are now breaking off sort of relational dependencies, right? If all you have is a login service, you know, that might be good enough to do with just a straight one single table with a key value lookup uh, or, you know, two columns, and you have no other data in that service because all you're trying to do is authenticate people and log them into the site. Right, so you would keep very little information. Maybe you put in like a timestamp of the last time they came in or their IP, but none of that necessarily is data that you're trying to, to track you know, alongside other stuff. That doesn't really matter when it comes to, well, the last time they talked in the forums, I don't really care. So this data is now split off. What I've seen and, and, and where we've done this is, is we end up seeing that a lot of these very simple services, the more you break this down, uh, you start to have an argument against using you know, Postgres for sort of all of these pieces, right? If you start on Postgres and you break this out, you end up having to make a choice of, well, if all I'm doing is a single table with key value lookup, there are actually better systems for that than Postgres, right? You can argue that keeping everybody on Postgres means simplified operations, and I think that's a pretty valid argument, right? If we all understand how Postgres works and we know its failure modes and, and 
we know how to deal with that. And you know, if you really get into this, you're starting to get familiar with the source code, or you know how packages are done, and sort of understand all of those things. Um, that's a strong argument for keeping that. But don't be surprised if people start to say, you know what, I can get 10x, you know, performance if I switch to you know Voldemort or something like that, where it's it's such a simple system and it does a very simple thing, but that's all you really need for this one slice, right? Um, that's sort of an internal trade-off, depending on the size of your team and you know if you're bored or whatever, that you want to introduce other pieces of, of software in your architecture. Um, but if you start to go down this path, it's just something to be aware of that, that that's a very likely outcome uh, that, that could happen. So, and I don't necessarily think there's anything wrong with that. Um, I think as, as most people are seeing, you know, Postgres is really starting to play in a lot of a lot more mixed architectures. There's the foreign data wrapper stuff that's coming out where you know people are working on how do we get Postgres talking to other systems, uh, and I think those pieces are, are becoming more you know accessible and available to folks. Um, so I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing to have these sort of heterogeneous environments, um, but be aware that, that that's probably somewhere down your path as you start to split these services out. All right, so sharding. So let's say we, we don't want to go that route. Um, when, you, when you do the sort of SOA thing, it is important to realize that as you're vertically scaling these pieces up and then you're splitting out new components, you can kind of see that there are some limitations to that. Right? You still may have to get into the, the big hardware game, uh, or you may sort of look at like, well, I don't really, want, like I said, maybe you don't want to develop the forum software, so you also may not want to spend a lot of time, you know, you don't want to buy big hardware, but you also don't want to spend a lot of time trying to break off individual pieces of forum software and managing that problem. Right? You'd like to focus more on, on sort of core business. So in those cases, right, that's where people will turn away from sort of the SOA idea and, and try to go down the sharding route. So looking at sharding, right, we basically have data split across servers based on some kind of algorithm. Uh, and, and I'm using algorithm very loosely here. Uh, you can do it with like actual math, uh, and there are systems that are designed to do it that way. Um, but you can also you know, just have a system where anytime data comes in, you map it to a location, uh, and then that's where it's going to live in the future. Right? Uh, and it doesn't have to be necessarily math-based. You can do it you know, based on IP or whatever. So, you come up with some sort of rule for how we're going to spread data around, uh, and then you put it there. Right? So your data will come in, your app is writing generally to something, and then the data gets dropped into these buckets underneath, right? which are sort of individual Postgres components. Um, and if, if you think about, you know, so you're splitting each piece of data. If I'm a user, I log in, my user data goes someplace uh, where I live. Um, that does kind of mean you know, potentially if that node goes down, you might lose my data, which would be bad. Uh, so a lot of people will actually try to do this in the multiple buckets, so that anytime somebody, you know, signs up, we're going to hash their system, and then we'll figure out two places to store their data. So now we have a duplicate copy. If one system goes down, we still have the ability to service them. Uh, since the algorithm piece does, you know, could be anything you want, you can make that as complex or as simple as you want as well. Right? I generally recommend doing it simple and flexible uh, that you can manipulate to your whim, but uh, if you want something more automated, a lot of times people will find some kind of hash algorithm and just go with that. Right. Normally in these architectures, uh, you have sort of an intermediate piece of, of, of software-hardware combo um, that is sort of doing the magic hash algorithm. Right. If you think of like PL proxy is a good example where you have this sort of database sitting there, you call a function that's calling PL proxy, which is then talking to these other databases behind it. Right? Uh, you can do that obviously with, with sort of any other architecture in that sense, where you talk to something, it doesn't have to be a database, it could be you know an application server or something like that, that then knows here's how I split my data out. Um, I think PG Pool 2 sort of works sort of the same way from a very high level point of view. You talk to the primary, it knows there's these other nodes going on behind it. Um, you know, and a lot of people use this for different needs. Like if you look at uh, Aster data, if any of you ever worked on that, it's uh, a Postgres-based system. Uh, and again, you talk to a, a node out in front, which is sort of the clean, right? And then it has this like beehive, as they call it, behind the, behind the scenes where it's talking to the individual nodes. And you can bypass those and go directly to those nodes if you know what you're doing. Uh, that's fine. Um, but generally, you're talking to this thing in front that does the hashing algorithm. Um, 
you know, or does the mapping system. Uh, in the case of, of a mapping system, you kind of need something to keep track of the data, right? If you have a hash algorithm, you can duplicate that logic pretty much to any application or any part of your infrastructure and say, this is how you will find data and this is how you will put data in. And you don't need a centralized place to keep track of that, right? Because everything is supposed to work off the magic hash. Um, if you're doing a mapping system, you need somebody to keep track of the mapping, right? So a lot of times that could be an independent database that is, you know, the user signs up. So in database one, we store the user in his data location, right? And then subsequent calls from the application always say, I have this user, let me go get his data location first. And then they do a call to the individual database where his data is. Right. You don't, again, you don't have to do that in a system. It's usually done that way. If you're doing a hash algorithm, it's more common that you put that directly in your app, right? And so it just knows where to talk to. Uh, and it doesn't have to go through an intermediary. But I, I think either of these two approaches is valid, though. I mean, I've definitely seen systems built both ways. Um, I tend to prefer the mapping system because I find it more flexible uh, than the, the magic hash algorithm. But if you're looking for software to actually help you do this that you don't have to write, probably you would be pushed towards the magic hash algorithm mode, right? Because it's easier for someone writing software to just say, here's my hash, I will split all my data up this way, and then I can shuffle it around if I need to. So looking at individual shards, even once you've decided, like, well, we're going to do shards, you know, we pick, we're going to do a map. Uh, when you look at the individual shards, there's still two ways of, of going about building those individual shards. Right? So one, one method is I sort of call it the scatter method, where your, your table data is going to be divided randomly across nodes uh, and, and sort of pseudo-random in the sense that you have your hash algorithm, which sticks it in a bucket, but you're not intervening with that. Right, you just throw the data in, the hash tells you it goes over here, and so you stick it over here, and you don't really think much about that. You don't care where that data is. Right? And if you think about it, probably more like a RAID system, where you don't tell the RAID system which spindle to put your data on. Right? You just hand the data down, and you know, maybe you don't even know how many spindles there are, you don't know if it's hardware or software RAID or whatever, you just hand in your data down, and it's gonna stick it on a disk somewhere. Right? And you don't care as long as you get the, the data back. Um, so that, that's sort of what we're talking about with the, the scatter mode. And you can do it again. You can do hashes, checksums. Um, you can even you can push it towards like doing like a tenant system where you're like, well, if somebody's logging in and, and they're like a free customer, we stick them over on this server, um, you know, or this cluster of servers. If they're paying, then we put them on the actual good hardware where we have failover. Uh, and so you can split that way. So you can start to try to force it some way. But generally, you're not keeping it on an individual basis. So you scatter the data across the nodes. Uh, you're able to look that back up. You're hoping to get even distribution across the nodes that you have. right? Um, that's the, the main goal here, uh, is that as you, you, know, you put in monitoring, uh, do capacity planning on individual nodes so that you can see as your service grows, I may have to add new nodes. When you add new nodes, you typically rebalance the workload. Uh, to spread it across the new systems that you brought up. Right. If you if you kind of do that and you do it, you know, with Postgres and you build it that way, um, I think to me what is really tricky is that this is okay if all of your queries are very like primary key lookup based, right? And if you look at most applications, it turns out most of them, you know, 75, 80, 90 percent are a lot of primary key lookups, right? And so that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, it does become though, very hard to do joins or complex queries across the data, right? Because even for an individual person, uh, when, I, when I first logged in, you know, one piece of my data might have gone on this node. Uh, now when I talked into the forum, like it went on a different node. Uh, when I set up items, like that just goes, you know, through the item hash, and so it's on some other node. And if you try to pull all that together in a query, you're actually querying across different systems, which doesn't really work. So you end up having to do a lot of sort of the join and, and collection of data in the application layer. Right. Uh, again, there are software systems that will try to help you with this problem. Um, it's definitely very similar to if you've looked at any MapReduce systems or NoSQL systems that try to implement that, you're, you're heading down that line, right, where you're just sending your data out and then you have some system where we're just going to look and, and gather the data back and, and return it. Um, that's usually not a favorite method, I think, for most people who are DBAs. You actually like writing SQL. You like seeing the relationships in your data. 
Uh, you like to be able to prove that everybody's data is okay, that kind of thing. Um, so I'm not, I'm, I'm generally never excited when I have to build a system like this. Um, just because, I, you know, I, I guess I come from that background of, of playing with data and, and SQL and that kind of thing. So the other way you can build this, though, and if you don't want to do the scatter data where, you know, your data is kind of going out based on whatever it is and, and hash algorithms, the other one is one that I sort of call swim lanes, right? So, and the idea with swim lane is basically that when, when you get a user in, you look at that user and you say, I'm going to designate this person to a given node. And I have a copy of my entire schema that's built around the user's model, right? And it's going to live on that node. And any data for that user, when it comes in, I'll map him to the node and I will always put all his data there, right? So like data ends up being grouped together on individual nodes, right? And you get what I would call sort of a semi-relational structure, right? And I say semi-relational in that if you have multiple services, it's likely that, that there might be pieces of data they need to interact with that are not on their individual node. Um, so you, you get some relational pieces because you can keep some of those things together, but there might be cases where some data that they put into the system actually does end up going someplace else because it's really not about them, it might be about someone else, right? It allows for more traditional SQL, right? If you're building applications and, and you know, your app developers are good at SQL, this might be a little better for them. Uh, if they hate SQL or everything is sort of abstracted away, then you know, not, not as much of an advantage. You still do have to do data duplication if you go this route. Uh, and, and again, that goes back to the semi-relational na nature of this. Um, and, and I'll give you an example here. All right, so uh, most people are probably somewhat familiar with like Twitter, or Facebook, and those kind of things, right? social networking type stuff. Um, if I was doing like a follow model, right? so we're going to have people, you log in the system, and then you can follow other people within the system. Uh, so you know, a very simplified table structure is I have a user ID of a user, uh, and then I have the follow ID, which is the person I'm following. Right? Very simple. Um, in that model, right? so if, if I follow Steven, and that's you know, probably a bad idea because that will lead to trouble. But if I follow Steven, I would get one row in the table like this. And there is no like, converse relationship there, right? Uh, I'm not implying that he's following me as well. So I'm just seeing what he's doing and that's it. If he were to follow me, which would probably lead to even more trouble, I would have to have another row of data in the table to represent that, right? And that's sort of the, the contract I'm making from a schema design standpoint, right? So, Compare that to if you're doing a friend model, right, where you're just saying like, hey, I've got two friend IDs, uh, and if I friend someone, I'll put in the request, hey, I want to friend that person, and if he friends me back, like, I put this row in, and there's no real, you know, necessitation that you have two rows on the table. You're just saying these two people are friends. Uh, this can lead to fun and interesting SQL, right, because Theoretically, this means the same thing, right? I've switched the, the order around in the columns, but really I'm saying the same thing. These two people are friends. So if you're trying to get a list of all my friends, you know, you have to, well, there's different ways you can do it, but a simple way, you could, you know, look in the first column for anything, if I'm number 12, so look everything where there's a 12 in the first column, union that with everything where there's a 12 in the second column, right? And now you have a list of all my friends. Uh, and there's, there's definitely more complex ways to do that that are, are fun and entertaining, uh, especially if you're at the bar, but, um, for simple purposes, like you're just saying, hey, I got one row in the table. Uh, this represents this friendship or relationship between two people. So the problem is that now if you're looking at a sharded model, right, where you want to keep an individual's information close to them on a shard, the friend model is kind of difficult to implement, right? Uh, at least from the standpoint of not duplicating your data. If you were doing the follow model, it would be simple. Right, because you can put all of my followers on my shard next to my user information, have a foreign key from the user's table that's on my shard into my follower's table, right, where that's my stuff. And when somebody follows me back, that could go live on whatever shard that they're on. Um, but if you're doing a friend model, you really need something like this, right, where I have shard A, which is my info, and I put this relationship in there. And then on shard B, I need to also put the same relationship in there, right? So I'm essentially duplicating the data in that sense, even though I want it to mean the, main, the, the same thing. And when you do this, your application code actually has to be the one that's responsible for taking care of this. Right? If I decide, you know, uh, 
Stephen kept me out at the bar too late last night, and I almost didn't make it here for my talk. It's <laughs> hypothetical, of course. Um, and I want to not be friends with him anymore. You know, my app has to be smart enough to delete that row both from my shard, but also figure out, hey, where are where are the people who have also friended me and go delete it from their shards, right? And, and that's not necessarily that hard to figure out. I would just you know grab a list of all the people that I've got a friend relationship with off of my shard. Then I have to go look them up and then go delete from their system. So it's definitely doable. It's more work in the application side to, to handle it that way. Right? But that's sort of the trade-off you're starting to make as you go into this shard stuff. Right? The database is not really going to be able to handle that for you. Um, you could do it, you know, you could you could build some complex triggers like you know, do some PL curl U stuff where you connect out to the other databases and delete those things. I would think that's insane. You'd be much better off doing it in the app. But realize that you do have to do it in your application. Uh, something's going to have to take care of those relationships because right? um, you're not going to be able to strictly enforce that you know, inside the database. So go, go sort of back to this. So we've got an app, right? talks to a main bucket, um, talks out to these individual buckets, and, and you can see that all of these systems will sort of look the same from that high level, but there can be different stuff going on underneath the hood. Right? If you choose algorithms, you choose swim lanes, you know, whatever those choices are, those trade-offs that you want to make, uh, one thing that you have to be aware of is that if, if you actually were to build it this way, right, so I've got single databases in all these places, that actually really isn't good enough to achieve all those things, you know, this maximum uptime, like, and all that good stuff. You actually need to sort of make your shards more robust, right, uh, because each shard is sort of a single point of failure to some extent, right, not for the entire system, but at least for portions of the system. Um, you want to have at least a failover database for all the individual shards, right? So that's one thing to be aware of. Like, I think a lot of people don't realize that idea of uh, if I decide, you know what, I've got a lot of users, I need to shard, I'm going to have a system out of front, I need to buy four more boxes because I'll have four nodes underneath, you actually really should buy eight more boxes because you need to have those four nodes and then do some kind of failover, right? Uh, you can sort of play tricks if you do, you know, enough data duplication or maybe replicate back to another shard or something along those lines. There's sort of ways to mitigate the hardware expense. Um, but often you get pushed into running many more servers, you know, than, than you're otherwise thinking of to begin with. So say you want at least a failover database, right, for each shard. Uh, but what I found is if you're really pushing for the idea of maximum uptime, uh, actually having, you know, and I'll say an asynchronous master master is better, right? Uh, and the reason that I say that is because as you're building these systems out, you may want to be able to do uh, an individual reboot of a server or something, right? We go back to the idea of, of patching Postgres or patching the operating system where you have to restart that database. Uh, to really get maximum uptime, you know, it's great that if I say I restart one node, well, only 25% of my users are affected, right? So I could do that, and, and maybe that's actually good enough. I know that for 25% of the people, there'll be you know, a five minute outage window at midnight tonight. And then I'll do another one for the next shard the next night, and so on and so forth, where I've sort of never had to take down the entire system, right? And it might even look like it's been up for a lot of people, but I know I'm still impacting some folks. Um, if you want to sort of even get rid of that problem, right, you end up doing either like this master master, you can do this with Sony, you know, something that has a switchover capability where on that individual node, I've got that replicated. So I can either tell my application, hey, I need to do maintenance on you know, shard A1, let's say. Uh, so for now, please go talk to shard A2. Right? Uh, and then I'll do my maintenance on shard A1, and then I can bring it back up, and I can switch back if I want to. Right? So all the, the fun tricks that you learned about with a single database where you tried to keep all that stuff up and running, you can still apply all those fun tricks to these individual nodes. Right? And you'll need to do that to some extent. You definitely don't want to be the case where if you look at it and say, well, I've shared in my data, and if I lose a node, I lose 25% of my users, that's actually probably a larger hit than most people would want to take. Uh, and the answer of, well, just have like you know, 100 shards, and then you only lose 1% of your users, probably is not really that great either. Um, so don't, don't get into thinking like, you know, this magically solves a lot of problems. You still need to know and still need to do a lot of the things that you did early on. And in fact, they just, you know, there's just more overhead to all of that, right? Instead of having one failover box, you now have to maintain like five of them. Uh, so there's more work to be done there. It's great for job security if you look at it from that standpoint, but um, if you're overworked and they won't hire anyone to help you, then perhaps not the best route to go.
So. Uh, I want to try to do some, some what I call the universal truths of scaling databases. Uh, I think they're generally fairly universal. Um, so, so we'll see. But uh, so one of the things I said, right, as you're going through that that sort of life cycle of things, um, looking at, at getting good vertical scalability out of individual nodes is helpful for for every pattern, right? If you're doing swim lanes or you're doing hash algorithms or you know you're trying to do SOA, any of those things, the more performance you can get out of an individual node, uh, the better off you are in the long run, right? Uh, it's one of the reasons why. I've always liked to use Postgres for these types of systems because I know it scales vertically, you know, compared to a lot of the other open source systems. So I think, to me, that's sort of a universal truth, right? The better performance you can get off a single node, the fewer nodes you need overall, the easier it is to maintain the system. The other thing to always remember is that new nodes are never free, right? If you think about trying to shard an application, for most people, that actually means you need to do probably extensive rewriting of your application code to be able to understand, I now have multiple databases I have to talk to, I need a way to understand where to go look for data that I need at the time, right? I need to separate out those uh, fault tolerance issues where I, you know, I'm gonna break one piece off, I need my application to understand when that piece isn't there, it should keep going and be okay with that. Um, a lot of things that you don't have to think of if you're just writing an application to a single database. Right. So it's not even just a matter of you getting yourself on board. If you're the person trying to maintain these systems, if you're the DBA trying to, to architect this, you also need to have application developers on board. And you need to try to get them to understand, you know, this is no longer just sort of a black box that you're throwing data at, and I'll keep it going under the hood. Right. They will need to be aware of how the data is laid out. Right. They need to understand when you do schema changes, certain ones are good and bad, and, and we have to mitigate that. Uh, and you can't just treat this like, you know, a, a blank API that you throw data at, right? Nodes always have points of failure, right? You can, the, the good news being that when a single node dies, you don't affect everyone, right? So and you're much more likely to be able to pull off having a problem, fixing it, and nobody noticing. But there's more likely a chance that that will actually happen, right? Um, I, I think there's a... I forget the exact numbers, but the story of Google where like they have uh, a drive failure like once an hour or something like that, right? But nobody ever notices because they have so many drives that you know it continuously they're replacing these things, uh, but they keep enough stuff up that nobody ever notices that. Right? Uh, again, though, adding management costs adds complexity to the architecture, complexity to your app code. So and none of these things are good, right? But the the sort of truth of the matter is that if you're really going to push for this, millions of users. You know, no downtime environments. Um, the tools of a single box are, are sort of, you know you're gonna have issues with that, right? There is no way around, I have one box and I need to apply the latest minor Postgres release, uh, and then somehow magically I didn't take everything down, right? You can try to mitigate that as much as possible, uh, but to, to really push for that, you end up having to go into these types of architectures. So. That's mostly it. Um, I will post these slides at exilla.net, which is my website. Um, I'm at Rob Trutti on Twitter. If I don't send these or post them, then book me there. Uh, if you found any of this potentially useful or interesting, I would recommend checking out onti.com Surge, which is a scalability conference that we put on in Baltimore, uh, where there'll be a lot more discussions along these lines of people doing this type of work uh, and, and doing sort of large scale infrastructure stuff. Um, otherwise, I'm happy to take questions, or we'll all run and, and hide and, and get to our next talk. Okay. Yes, sir. Comment, which is that when you're doing the scaling stuff, a lot of it's very application uh, risk, right? But a lot of uh, data uh, caps are done outside the application reporting and so forth. So when you go uh, to the starting model, it's really good to have a good system that you have to service those other Yeah, that's, that's definitely true. That's, and that's one thing to be aware of. Right? When, I, when I mentioned the idea of you have to have the app developers on board, um, one of the things you have to also realize is what are, it, it's not just about necessarily the application, but what are all the other internal services that you used to do? Uh, and in a lot of cases, you, know, you might have users that ran reports to pull data out, and it was really easy for them to do that because all your data was consolidated in one place. Right, so the idea of taking 
the data you've built into the sharded architecture, uh, a lot of times what we'll do is consolidate that back into a single instance, right, uh, where you combine the data that you cannot be reporting in a more traditional manner, right, because you've got all the data there that you actually need. And the reason why that, that tends to, to not be such a crazy idea is that if you have sort of a reporting database, the needs are usually much, much different than what you have on a front-end application database, right? Uh, you have, usually it's a handful of users internal to the company. You know what hours they work. If you tell them, hey, for five minutes I need to restart the server, like that's just an email to those five people, and you know, they're like, oh, okay, that's fine. I'll be at lunch at one o'clock, can you do it then? You know? um, it, it's sort of much easier to manage that, so it's okay in that sense. So it's definitely be aware of that, that you will have sort of these other things that are not driven from you know, maybe your main customer facing one, and that stuff is the thing where you're like, I got these millions of users in this maximum uptime that's driving you into the sharded architecture. There will be other users that you have with very different requirements, and don't be afraid to pull this data back out, put it into a system that works better for them. <clears throat> yep? Doesn't the mapping system just replace the single point of failure, where if you have the machine that basically dictates where everybody lives and where all your data is, what happens when you need to take down that machine? Right, so that's where you go with, I need like some kind of redundant system there, right? Switch over based or, you know, something similar to that, right? So that's, to me, I say the answer to that is, is do the asynchronous master master, right? So that if I need to take that one side of it, I can always have a config in my app that says, hey, ma you know, mapping one and mapping two is like the array of databases that you talk to, right? And I'll tell you which one to go to first. And if I know I need to do maintenance on mapping one, then I'll push a config out to the application servers and say, hey, start talking to mapping two. Once the apps are talking to mapping two, I can now do whatever I need to you know, with mapping one, and I've never actually had to have any downtime. So it's, that's the problem. It's not a panacea, right? Like, you're right. It does, that's your, probably your most critical one, because if it goes down and you've done it from a mapping standpoint, people don't know where to talk. You know, they don't know where to go find the data, so that can lead to trouble. Um, and that's one reason why a lot of people push for the magic cache algorithm, right? Because you can put that in your application, and then you figure, well, everybody always knows how to go find the data, right? That's one of those trade-offs that people make. Um, the reason I like the mapping stuff is it gives me finer grain control, right? If I suddenly get one user who either has, you know, millions of followers, right, then I can put them on their own node all by themselves. And in magic hatch algorithm land, typically you can't do that. So um, definitely a very valid concern, though. Yep. You keep saying asynchronous master master, and you're not telling us why you precluded synchronous master master. Wouldn't that be a safer option? Safer from the standpoint of not losing data, probably. But from the standpoint of I need to do something with one node, uh, and if that node goes down, Right, I still want the system up and running. Right? And with synchronous, I'm basically saying these two guys are tied together. Right? So there's much more of a coupling there between those two. Right? So, I don't know if that makes that clear. Right? It so, does make it clear yeah. that you, you've already I traded said off. That, right, yeah, yeah. You haven't, you've traded off correctness for uh, performance. I, I think, yeah, but I sort of look at that. In this system, it's a given. right? Like you, you decided, if you shard, you basically decided, I'm going to, I'm going to enforce correctness in some other way than at my database level, right? Because you can't do all the foreign keys and, and constraints that you would normally do in a sharded architecture. Hey, we're still talking about, because you had it for even the, the shard nodes being master master, so it's even down at that level. Sure, I mean, to some extent, yes. But So in a grand vision, I was saying you, you've given up full control of that. So you want to try to wedge in as much as you can, yes. You know, that, that trade-off for, for synchronous master, well, the real problem with synchronous master master is there really just aren't any that are really production worthy, so in my opinion, I guess. Um, synchronous master master, you know, Postgres-based systems. Um, if anyone is running one of those and wants to do a talk on that, I'm sure we'd like to hear it, because I mean, that, that, I think, folly lies down that road in a lot of cases. No offense to the few people I know are trying to build those systems, but um, the asynchronous ones, I at least believe, will work in production, right? Uh, there's two that I've used, so, so I'll, I'll go back to that. I mean, I've used Picardo in production, uh, I've used Ruby Rep in production, uh, and both of those, you know, they have their own warts and faults, uh, definitely. And I know there's people that would never run those systems, but those are ones at least I've seen used in production and have some faith that they would work. So, uh, and I, you know, 
you know, a lot of people have overlooked, uh, we, we tend to scoff at MySQL's replication systems, but the ability to say, I can write to either node and it'll just push the data over the other way and, and take care of things for me, as long as I'm not dumb about that, it will do the right thing, right? Actually lends itself to, to definitely having two databases up at all times and then just telling my app, right, which one to talk to at a time. And there's a lot of advantages to that because it's much easier to control what the application is doing, right? You have to do that anyways. Even if you're able to switch back and forth between masters on a, on a replication system of a database, your application still needs to know which one of those two to talk to, right? So if you have to coordinate at the application level anyways, then why not just put the control in the application's hands uh, as long as your database will let you push one way or the other? So. Definitely a good, good question. I, I didn't call you. Uh, go ahead. So, so you're having this conference in Baltimore. You know everything I know about Baltimore is from watching The Wire. So are, are, are you having it there because it's a really good place to obtain Magic Cash App? I, I don't think I can actually speak to that. Um, it might be. They eat a lot of good blue crab on The Wire, so it's a plus. Anything else? Yeah. All right, you're all free to go.